The scripture reading today, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. When he had traveled on, a young man came and knelt in the dust of the road in front of Jesus. You know, the young man, good teacher, what must I do to gain life in the world to come? Jesus answered, you are calling me good. Don't you know that God and God alone is good? Anyway, why ask you that question? You know the commandments of Moses. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not slander. Do not defraud. And honor your father and mother. Young man answered, yes, teacher, I have done all these since I was a child. Then Jesus, looking at the young man, saw that he was sincere and responded out of his love for him. Son, there is still one thing you have not done. Go now, sell everything you have, and give the proceeds to the poor, so that you will have treasure in heaven. After that, come, follow me. The young man went away sick at heart at these words because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked around to see if his disciples were understanding his teachings. Jesus to his disciples, Oh, it is hard for people with wealth to find their way into God's kingdom. Disciples amazed said, why? Jesus says, you heard me. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God for those who trust in their wealth. I think you'll see camels squeezing through the eye of a needle before you'll see the rich celebrating and dancing as they enter into the joy of God's kingdom. The disciples looked around at each other, whispering. And aloud to Jesus, they said, Then who can be liberated? Jesus, smiling and shaking his head, For human beings, it is impossible, but not for God. God makes everything possible.
Some of us look like this when we don't get our coffee anymore, right? <laughs> Not my coffee, right? He becomes this creature, this dangerous, desperate creature known as Golem. His entire life, his entire world becomes centered on this one thing. And it, it keeps him from all other relationships. It makes him do things he's not actually wanting to do, but he ends up doing them anyway. My precious, he says. Redemption, redemption is possible if we just give up blank. Now, I don't know what will go in the blank for you. I don't know what will go in the blank for me, but for Smeagol, for Golem, the thing that would go in the blank would be his precious, right? Roger read a passage from Mark chapter 10. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10 if you have a Bible when we get there. Mark chapter 10. And uh, he read from verses 17 to 27. And in that passage, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. That's a name you should be fairly familiar with. Jesus is walking and teaching and traveling with his disciples. And this guy comes up, this young, rich, good looking guy comes up. And he starts talking to Jesus. And he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we don't know how this guy became a rich young ruler. Okay, We're not really told that. Uh, there's a good possibility he could have came into the money through his family. Just because he uses the term inherit, and we usually associate that with a family wealth being passed. But we don't know. All we know is this guy's wealthy. We know he has some sort of judicial power, some sort of ruling legislative power within his community. And so... He comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, in these days, the, the, the teachers, the rabbis, wouldn't take any, uh, any glory, any credit, any title that might be given to God. And so, uh, to call a teacher good is to associate them with God, to give them God's title, essentially. And so... This young guy comes up to Jesus and he basically says, you are as good as God. Now, that's not necessarily a wrong statement to make. But when I read through this this time, and I've taught on this passage, we actually went through this when we went through the story. You guys might remember that. Uh, when we talked about uh, when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? You might remember that. Uh, we went, if you don't, you can go back on the website and check that out. Uh, Jesus looks at this guy and says, you can't call me good. That only God is good. He's doing what the teachers do. He says, look, God has a, a separate higher place. It, to me, when I read through it this time, it almost seemed like this young guy is just trying to butter Jesus up. Let me pay you a, a high compliment and you'll let me in on the secret of eternal life. Let me give you a lot of credit, a lot of praise, and then you and I can have this little conversation about what I can do to gain, to earn, to get eternal life. And Jesus says, Roger, read, Jesus goes back and forth with this guy, and he says, you know the commandments. And the guy says, yeah, I know the commandments. I've kept them since I was a little boy. Right? I didn't kill anybody. I... You know, I, I, I don't lie, I don't steal. He goes through the whole list. And, and Jesus says, well, that's good. And he looks at the guy, and the text says he looks at the guy and he loves him. And if you remember the last time we were through this passage several months ago, I said that that's pretty rare. It's very rarely in Scripture does Jesus love a specific person. Now, he loves us all, okay? But just within Scripture, Jesus loving a specific person, that doesn't happen too often. But Jesus looks at this guy and says that he loves him. He looks at him and he looks right into his very life, his very heart, his, his soul. He sees the problem. And he says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go, take everything that you own, sell it, give all the proceeds to the poor, and then come follow me. He looks at the guy and sees the one thing, the precious thing, thing that is keeping him from a, a full-on, totally sold-out relationship with his God. 
He knows the scriptures forward and backward. He never missed a day at church. But there's one thing that is keeping him, that is an obstacle between him and God. And Jesus says, take that thing, get rid of it, and then come and follow me. That's kind of been our theme ever since we wrapped up the story, right? Was come and follow me. Leave where you are and come to me. Come to Jesus where I am. It's, it's, it's a, a journey, a shift in worldview and perspective. It says the guy went away sad because he had a whole lot of money. He couldn't give it up. He couldn't get rid of that one thing. The cost was just too high. Now, when I read through this story, and as I, as I say, I, I've read through it several times, and have preached through it a couple times, I read through this story, and it reminds me of Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's all sing along. <laughs> yeah. You guys might remember Father Abraham. Abraham, who is the father of the Israelite nation, uh, was called by God to leave his father's household and go to a place where God would show him. God promised him all sorts of things, land and blessing and descendants, as numerous as the stars. This is the book of Genesis, in case you're curious. And Abraham goes and he promised all these descendants, but year after year after year goes by and he doesn't have a single son. He tries something else and that doesn't really work. That's, that's not part of the plan. Finally, he and his wife, Sarah, have a little baby boy named uh, Isaac. <laughs> we'll be going through Genesis next year. <laughs> Just kidding. Isaac. He has this promised son, Isaac. And the boy grows up to be in a junior high or so and God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son, whom you love. First time the word love is mentioned in scripture. Whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him on an altar on Mount Moriah. Abraham walks Isaac up the mountain. He lays Isaac on the altar. He draws the dagger. He, get, he is ready to go. The blade starts to come down, and God says, Stop! I see that you're willing to move that thing that is most precious to you. Now, we don't know with the rich young ruler, we don't know had he gone back and started to sell everything, if God would have said, okay, I see you're serious about it, don't worry about selling everything. We don't know. We don't know what sort of connections he might have made when he sold everything and gave everything to the poor if he would have met someone that could have changed his life. We don't know. We don't know uh, what sort of network he might have been plugged into. We don't know what sort of journey, what sort of impact his faithful decision to follow could have had because he decided he felt more comfortable clinging white knuckled to his precious wealth. And he wasn't going to see that go. And so the disciples witness all this stuff going down and they're confused. Because the rich got everything. And that's just how it worked in, in that society. There wasn't welfare, okay? There wasn't a, a backup payment plan, a, a bailout system. It was just, if you had money, you got everything, right? If you needed something on this earth, you got it. If you needed promise of a special place in heaven, you paid the priest a little bit more, you got it. And so when Jesus says it's hard, it's near impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, the disciples are so confused because in their minds, a rich person got everything they ever wanted. And so if the rich can't do it, they say, who can? And Jesus said, well, if you try and do it yourself, if you try and earn your way in, if you try and bargain with God to get your special place in heaven, it's not going to work. Nobody buys their way into heaven. He says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. All things 
Pentecost. Everybody still with me? Everybody still awake? If you're not awake, wake up. So that's just the first part. Then the story continues. So Peter, who is always the first to speak up, if you know anything about Peter, Peter is always the gung-ho one of the group. Uh, if, if somebody needs to say something and everybody's quietly sitting with hands folded, Peter's the one who will say, wait just a minute, and he'll, he'll shout it out. He's the one who jumps out of boats and slices off ears and goes off full tilt. Peter decides to try another angle, and I am using the message paraphrase, by the way. Peter says, we left everything and followed you. He says, okay, Jesus, I'll track with you. You say the rich can't make it, all right. We left everything, everything we had. You guys remember when we talked about the call of the disciples, right? Jesus said, come, and they jumped out of their boats. Some of them left their old dad, left to hold them all the fish by himself. They left behind jobs and reputations and money and homes. Peter says, we left everything and followed you. Essentially what he's saying is, is everything going to be okay? I mean, I need some assurance with this decision. Because we, we risked everything. We gave up everything that we had, Jesus. Is it going to be all right? And this is what he says. Jesus said, Mark my words, no one who sacrifices house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or land, whatever, because of me and the message will lose out. He says, no one who gives things up, no one who leaves those things behind, no one who is willing to sacrifice their precious, that one thing for me, or for the message, the good news, the gospel, the mission of God. No one who sacrifices any of this stuff for me or the message will lose out. In fact, here's what it says. They'll get it all back, but multiply many times in homes and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land, but also in troubles, and then the bonus of eternal life. So not only are you getting it back? But you know, there's other bonus stuff too. Now, before we go any further, I just want to clear one thing up. I am not preaching the prosperity gospel here this morning. I am not telling you that if you put a dollar in the offering plate, that God will have a hundred dollars waiting for you back home. Okay? That's not at all what I'm promising. However, what I am promising is. If you're willing to put these things on the line for God, He will bless you. There's a difference. Right? I'm not promising, you know, rich Uncle Ken bags, giant dollar bill bags and burlap sacks of money when you get home. But He will bless you. Multiply many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land. And you think, how can this be? Well, it's very simple. When you live a life that's dedicated, focused on loving God and loving people, suddenly, their home is your home and your home is their home. <coughs> suddenly, you begin to see people and treat people and consider people to be like family, right? Brothers, sisters. When Jesus actually was teaching one time, he's in the middle of a, a, a real big seminar, okay? He's teaching a big group, and his mom and his brothers are outside, and somebody go, brings a, a little note up to Jesus. Jesus, your mom and brothers are outside. He said, well, my mother and my brothers are all here. He sees people differently. When your life is focused, centered, uh, all obstacles are removed, and it's just about loving God and loving people. Then suddenly you notice that you have been blessed with so much more than you had holding on white knuckle to that precious thing. But also, <laughs> trouble, right? Some of us, I'm guilty of this. You ever been around a person who is just too happy? <laughs> Somebody who's just giddy all the time. I kind of want 
them to, I don't know, trip? <laughs> or, I mean, maybe that's just the evil side. It's, it's something, sometimes it can be annoying, right? How can you be so happy? That's just how, how our, our, our broken human minds and our, our broken human world functions. When we see people who are happy, people who seem to have it all, we want to take it away. Or we want to break it. Trouble. He said, you get all this stuff. You get a, a family bigger than you can count. Their home is your home. Your home is their home. You have so many homes, you won't know what to do with it. But people are still going to persecute you. Jesus said elsewhere, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And then there's the bonus of eternal life. Jesus said, you get all of this good stuff. But wait, there's more. Remember, that's the one thing that the rich young ruler came up to ask about. How do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, eternal life, you're missing out on so much other stuff because you've got that one sole focus on your precious thing. Get rid of that and you'll notice how much you've been blessed. And then we'll have the bonus round of eternal life. Then Jesus he says this. This is once again the great reversal. Many who are first will end up last. And the last will end up first. He says this several times in scripture. First will end up last, last will end up first. Great shall be least, least shall be greatest. He who takes the highest seat will end up in the lower seat. He who takes the lowest seat will be in the highest seat. For me, I'm trying to wrap my mind this week on how to present this, how to think about this. For those of you who are money-minded, okay? You would invest in a stock that you knew was going to fail. Right? Okay. If somebody said you can buy a stock for pennies on the dollar, and the only catch is the, the, the stock prices are going to plummet and never recover. But you can get it really cheap. <laughs> We're going to stay away from that, right? If you know it is doomed, you're not going to invest in that. The same, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll switch gears here, clearly. Uh, if you're going to buy a car, right? You walk onto the car lot, some guy is slipped back there. Says, hey, you want to buy a car? Tell you what, I will sell you this car with complimentary air fresheners. And the only thing of it is, as soon as you leave the parking lot, the transmission is going to explode. And uh, the engine, well, it's made of plastic. And uh, we did put cereal in your gas tank. But beyond that, there are no troubles with this particular car. 500 bucks. <laughs> You wouldn't buy it. None of us would buy a car that we knew was going to fall apart and blow up. None of us would reach that special day, would reach that special day, dum dum da dum 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 da dum Bride walks up, she looks pretty, they all do. And the pastor is standing in front, he says, Dear little woman, we are gathered here to join for a week. These two people. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, you're going, wait, 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 what? A week? Nobody gets in a marriage that they know is going to fall apart. And yet we do this all the time. We invest in things that ultimately don't matter, things that won't last. We set aside so much time, so much effort, so much energy, and so much money towards things that just don't last. Yeah, like, like your reputation, right? It doesn't take long for a couple critics to hack down somebody's reputation. Uh, beauty, okay? 
it fades and falls and changes colors. Right? Status, it doesn't like. We, we spend so much time. Like, uh, this past week, we're doing the Crazy Love uh, study, and one of the questions that we uh, discussed as a group was, if you died today, what would you regret? What would you regret? What would be your biggest regret? Like, nobody reaches the end of their life, and on their deathbed, their last dying words, their nuggets of wisdom to the rest of the world, nobody says, I wish I would watch more TV. Nobody says that. Or like uh, games and stuff. I, I have this game, this is the confession time of PT. I have this game on my phone, and I'm building and developing a nice little village, okay? Uh, it's, it's really quite special. And I, I feel obligated every morning to make sure that the villagers are doing what they need to do. <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's the world we live in, right? That's the life that we've taken on. We, we invest and we, we, we dedicate so much of our lives to these stupid little things. If you died today, what regrets would you have? Would you have been the type of person that you wanted to be? Would you have spent your time and your money the way that that would honor God, that, that, you would, that you would be proud of? Would your relationships be in the state that you wish they could be? Redemption is possible if we just give up whatever it is that is blocking us from having a totally surrendered completely sold out life for Jesus. And then the story continues. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. They, being the disciples and Jesus, spent some time in Jericho. As Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples in a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting alongside the road. Everybody say Bart. Bart. That's a lot easier to remember than Bartimaeus. So we're going to go with Bart. A blind beggar named Bart. How's that for alliteration? Uh, is sitting alongside the road uh, on the way into Jericho. And he's sitting with other beggars. Uh, they're all lined up there, as beggars do. Uh, harassing people, trying to get people to give them something, some money, some food, some something. And, and Bartimaeus, Bart, is blind. He can't see. We don't know if he was blind from birth or if he got, you know, poked in the eye or what happened exactly. But he's blind. So he's got to rely on his other senses. And so as he's sitting there, as he always sits there, he hears a lot of commotion, a lot of footsteps, uh, a, a lot of noise and shuffling and talking and, and excited chatter. I was, I was uh, practicing this as I was, uh, when we were doing the offering, and I could see, I could hear people coughing and shuffling and talking. You, you pay attention to these things when, on your, when your other senses are shut off. And Bart, he's sitting there and he hears something about Jesus. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. Many people tried to hush him up. Don't bother. But he yelled all the louder, Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. No matter what it took, he was going to get Jesus' attention. Jesus stopped in his tracks, calling over. They called him, it's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. Now, if you've read through this story, okay, you will fly past that. But that is a big deal. Because as a beggar, he has nothing. Because he's blind, 
He has nothing. In fact, he's considered unclean, unworthy, unwanted. His coat was probably something given to him by the government, specifically to mark him as a beggar so that people wouldn't touch him. His coat, as a beggar, was his pillow at night. His coat, as a beggar, protected him from the harsh mid-eastern sun. His coat kept him warm on cold Arabian nights. His coat, as a beggar, protected him from all the rats and the vermin that would come up and try and nibble on him while he was trying to sleep. His coat was everything. And when Jesus calls him to come, he throws it to the side because he knows what Jesus is going to give him is going to be so much better than anything that he can hold on to. And Jesus said, what can I do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus, your faith has saved and healed you. In that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road. Some of our, our texts will say your faith has healed you. The original language, uh, the word is sozo. Everybody say sozo. Sozo. So yeah, Greek, got love it. And it actually is a term associated with salvation. Your faith has saved you. This act of throwing away what is blocking our relationship, throwing away what you could, you could ultimately lose. If, if this didn't work, okay, if, if Jesus said no, this guy has just given up his coat, he's blind, and so who knows if somebody will take it? Who knows if he will ever find it again? And because it might be gone, who knows if he will even make it through the night? And yet he risks it all on Jesus. And Jesus says, your faith has saved and healed you. We need to give up what is blocking our relationship. We need to give up and overcome and move to the side that obstacle, that thing, that precious precious thing that we cling on to and we say, no God, you can't have it. No God, you can't have it. And God says, well, I have to. This relationship is 100%. There's no holding back. There's no safety plan. He says, I am the safety plan. And in that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus. <clears throat> we have one man who couldn't see, but his faith in Jesus healed him, and so he began to follow Jesus. Earlier in this chapter, we had another man who had the same invitation to come and follow, and yet he was blinded by that precious thing that he wouldn't give up. Faith is saved. I want to close with this. It's a, a story called The Treasure. The cheerful girl with bouncy golden curls was almost five. Waiting with her mother at the checkout stand, she saw him, a circle of glistening white pearls in a pink foil box. Oh, please, Mommy, can I have them? Please, Mommy, please. Quickly, the mother checked the back of the little foil box and then looked back into the pleading blue eyes of her little girl's upturned face. A dollar ninety-five. That's almost two dollars. If you really want them, I'll make them some extra chores for you and in no time you can save enough money to buy them for yourself. Your birthday's only a week away and you might get another crisp dollar bill from Grandma. As soon as Jenny got home, she emptied her penny bank and counted out seventeen pins. After dinner, she did more than her share of chores, and she went to the neighbor and asked Mrs. McJames if she could pick dandelions for 10 cents. On her birthday, Grandma did give her another new dollar bill, and at last she had enough money to buy the necklace. Jenny loved her pearls, 
They made her feel dressed up and grown up. She wore them everywhere, Sunday school, kindergarten, even to bed. The only time she took them off was when she went swimming or had a bubble bath. Mother said if they got wet, they might turn her neck green. <laughs> Jenny had a very loving daddy, and every night when she was ready for bed, he would stop whatever he was doing, come upstairs to read her a bedtime story. One night when he finished the story, he asked Jenny, Do you love me? Oh, yes, Daddy, you know that I love you. Then give me your pearls. Oh, Daddy, not my pearls, but you can have Princess, the white horse from my collection, the one with the big tail. Remember, Daddy, the one you gave me? She's my favorite. That's okay, honey. Daddy loves you. Good night. And he brushed her cheek with a kiss. About a week later, after the story time, Jimmy's daddy asked again, Do you love me? Daddy, you know I love you. Then give me your pearls. Oh, Daddy, not my pearls. But you can have my baby doll, the, the brand new one I got for my birthday. She, she's so beautiful, and you can have the yellow blanket that matches her sleeper. That's okay. Sleep well. God bless you, little one. Daddy loves you. And as always, you brush your cheek with a gentle kiss. A few nights later, when her daddy came in, Jenny was sitting on her bed with her legs crossed Indian style. As he came close, he noticed her chin was trembling, and one silent tear rolled down her cheek. What is it, Jenny? What's the matter? Jenny didn't say anything, but lifted her little hand up to her daddy. And when she opened it, there was her little pearl necklace. With a little quiver, she finally said, Here, daddy, it's for you. With tears gathering in his own eyes, Jenny's kind daddy reached out with one hand to take the dime store necklace, and with the other hand, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a blue velvet case with a strand of genuine pearls and gave them to Jenny. He had them the whole time. He was just waiting for her to give up the dime store stuff so he could give her genuine treasure. Some of us are holding on whatever that is, so tiny and so desperate. And maybe today, we can hand it over and say, here, Daddy, it's for you. God, we thank you. We thank you for blessing us in all the ways that you have, ways that we can't even see, ways that we don't fully understand. And God, sometimes we, we cling on to things. We cling on to certain parts of our life. We cling on to certain things that we've acquired. We cling on to certain things that we've accomplished. And, and we keep them from you. We hoard them from you. And, and you patiently call us to hand them over. You won't, you won't always take them from us, but you ask that we be willing to hand them over. To give them to you. Because if this relationship is going to be real, if this relationship is going to go anywhere, we have to be in it 100% and hold nothing back. We have to be willing to say yes before you even ask us the question. So I pray today that you would take that, take that problem, take that accomplishment, take that Acquirement. Take that issue, take that habit, take that whatever it is, lay it at your feet, and say that it's for you. Do with it what you will. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.